respectful of everyone's answers when you do answer a question. I want you to use your um, your voice capabilities, use your speakers, uh, or you can also use your chat. And whatever question that we ask going forward, we're going to put into the chat so you can um, see what answers go with what questions. But there's all types of ways that we describe community engagement. But right now we're in this, what we could call the new normal because we have COVID-19. And COVID-19 put the whole country on lockdown around March. But before there was COVID-19, if you had to describe what we mean by the phrase community engagement, what would you have said? And at this point, if you want to, Liz, type that question and put it in the chat box and let people answer there. And then there's, this is not a super large group. There's less than 30 of us. So I hope that you all feel comfortable to unmute yourself and then share your answer to that. So if you could describe the phrase, community engagement before COVID-19, what words would you use to describe it? In the chat, I see Sarah saying a set of outreach activities probably focused around large in-person meetings. Someone else. Um, this is Michael Kelly from uh, Michael KC. Um, another way I describe community engagement is um, meeting with those who aren't normally involved in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So meeting with people that are not normally involved. Um, Cedar is saying yes, probably foot traffic into our nonprofit and others. Um, how invested in our community, our members and in each other. I think before COVID-19, I would describe it as a strong emphasis on in-person activities. And then probably a big push to figure out how interactive you can make that experience. But what are some other things that come to mind? Karen is saying what should be is one thing. But most often, um, it comes in the form of quote unquote public meetings. Mm -hmm. I think that's very fair. Surveys as well as in person engagement. Mm -hmm. I think that's right too. Anything else? Hearing the voice of those who will be impacted by mo excuse me, by most, by, excuse me, impacted most by the project or development. And that's from LaMonica. Hey, LaMonica. Okay. I'm going to close that for a second and go to the next thing that I want to show you all, which is this. This is something called the participation spectrum. It's by the International Association of Public Participation. Some people may have seen this, some may have, might not have. A lot of governments or public agencies use this spectrum to, to help frame what their engagement approach is going to be like. And it goes from left to right, from the empower to the empower. And I think what I wanna draw attention to is the empower side of it because the base of that word is power. And in this, usually in my perspective, since I'm, in the private sector, what happens is the client has the power, the final say in whatever we're doing that we're trying to engage around. And so what can happen is depending on um, what your agency has the capacity to do, or in my case, what the client wants to do, et cetera, sometimes you can be kind of stuck in the inform side of this, which is the, the lighter side. You're just sharing information basically. I think a lot of our scopes and fees that we develop for projects hover around the consult or involve. If you look at the involve and you notice where it says promise to the public, that's where you start hearing about an iterative process because most planning and design is iterative. So you do a part A and a part B and a part C and all of those build on one another. And so what we 
are usually doing is we're engaging and we're trying to learn from one another and then what we learn from our community members or our stakeholders is what gets incorporated into our plans, our designs, our initiatives, our projects. And then we report back on how we've done that, how we haven't done that, that type of thing. I think what's missing often is that collaborate and empower because that does begin to say who where the decision making authority is. And I think one of the reasons why it's difficult for organizations and agencies to let the community be in a more collaborative relationship with them or to empower them is because there are rules and regulations and things that begin to get in the way of that. Sometimes government agencies are worried about liability. What if a community says they want us to fix their zoning and or they want us to change their stormwater requirements or they want us to put bike lanes everywhere or they want us to improve their sidewalks and we don't have the capacity to do that because we don't have that in the budget. That would stop them from keeping or excuse me, allowing the public to say, hey, this is what we want and we are we want you to demonstrate that you're going to provide that tends to be a bit of a barrier. So when we are planning for engagement, often I find that we stick in that inform, consult, involve, and then all the power in the, at the end of that process and even throughout that lies with the client or the agency, the owner of the project. So that means that when we ultimately write our community engagement plans, which is sort of our playbook for how we're going to do engagement, it outlines who we're going to talk to, what our goals for engagement are, what activities we're going to use. And to your earlier comments, we're often talking about in-person activities, we're talking about surveys. If you have a local office, you could be getting foot traffic into your space to engage and talk with people, et cetera. We even take our stakeholder groups and we start organizing them. So depending on what you're what you think of when I say stakeholder, I want to define to you, for you all what stakeholder means to me in every instance, which is anybody that could be affected or have an interest in a project. So that could be the highest person with the top position in the land to um, the person with no position, anyone who could be affected or have an interest. So that's a wide range of people. And when we use that spectrum to outline how we're going to do engagement, we start putting people into buckets to fit within that. And that again begins to reinforce how much power community members, certain stakeholder groups are going to be able to have in a process or for a project. So prior to COVID-19, we knew that we could, uh, we would use a lot of the same tactics that you had mentioned before, our activities and tools. But now we have COVID-19 and this map is from earlier in the week. This is showing coronavirus cases per capita across the country. So where you see the darker colors or where you see most of the where you see the most cases. And because of this, this has shifted everyone to what we're doing right now, which are more digital things. What I think is really interesting about this is that digital is not new. If we were in the room, I would say, everybody raise your hand if you've heard about digital tools. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we have online survey tools right now, is there's all types of things. And I think something that happened I thought was interesting is that I have projects that I work on and we always have a combination of in-person and digital engagement because people don't really come to meetings like they used to. So we need to have multiple options, more than one option for them to be able to be part of a project and share their voice and have it be heard. So I would have clients say, hey, Therese, we need to, we've had a meeting and we need to be sure that we have a digital engagement approach. What have you been thinking? Well, we always have engagement. The difference is how robust is that and often how robust it is has to do with you know how much funding is available and also I think even greater than that is what are people comfortable with and the pandemic has forced people because their backs are against the wall in many respects to think about other things and be more creative so you're seeing more things you know I remember that you're seeing more than just online surveys most of us have heard about SurveyMonkey. SurveyMonkey is not new. It was established in 1999. And I remember like probably in the early 2000s, um, I was in a group of people and we were talking about how we could um, find out some information from a particular set of stakeholders. And I said, oh, we, well, we could use this thing called SurveyMonkey. And I remember that the group said, we don't wanna use something called SurveyMonkey because of the name. But now SurveyMonkey is the base thing that anybody would go to if you wanted to do online engagement. Facebook is not new. Most people have a Facebook account. There are billions of people online that have Facebook. 
we have MindMixer, there's MapSeed, and now there are tools that combine a lot of the other things into one package. And so you have the bang the tables of social pinpoints, the publicinput.com. All of those things do your email marketing, they do your website, they do your polling, your survey, your video capture, all those things together in one platform. And so those are becoming more and more popular, but still, those aren't new. Something else that's interesting also is that right now, everybody's chatting. One of my favorite things to say is let's chat, let's have a video chat, especially when I wanna meet new people because we're stuck at home. Some people, depending on where you are in the country, who's in your network, you're seeing that some people are out and about, communities are starting to open up. Well, it doesn't mean that it's 100% safe to just be out and about. So people are continuing to use their video chat tools. We all know, I imagine that Zoom is probably the most popular thing that people are using. That's what we're on right now. Microsoft Teams is pop pos excuse me, popular. There's WebEx. People who have Apple products were using FaceTime and Periscope. There's all these things that are out there right now that people are using. And something that's interesting, I think, about that is that lockdown started around March, mid-March, and now it's June. It takes about two months for somebody to establish a habit. And so what I think that means for engagement in our new normal is that what we're experiencing now is going to be normal in terms of providing options for people. And I would call them social connections, social connections opportunities. We know that there's, there are the terms uh, social distancing and physical distancing. Social distancing started to create a certain amount of stigma and concerns about people being isolated. So then we started saying we're going to use physical distancing and we know that that means six feet apart. In some places it means more than six feet apart when you're talking to people out in public. Um, we're also talking about engagement that's interactive and fun because the things that we do in person, like some of those um, pictures that I showed you where people are out and about, they're doing things together, all of that, you can create a form of that online. And a lot of those all-in-one tools allow you to be able to create some of that fun, give people variety while they're doing engagement. And then that variety is also available 24-7. And it could be with a robust community engagement platform, or it could be with SurveyMonkey. It could be with the software that I developed, which is called Digicate. That's a survey tool as well. What that means is you're making engagement available to people whenever they have the time. And that respects and honors what's going on in their life because people have a lot of things going on. There's economic concerns right now. There were economic concerns before, but they're even more drastic today. And we're asking as we you know, do engagement to basically get into people's time, um, to give comment on something that they might not have been thinking about early. So we want to be sure that we have lots of tools available to them and use the tools that are familiar with them. So I think social media is also a must have. Again, billions of people are on Facebook. And if you look inside of your particular community, wherever you are in the country, there are probably thousands and thousands of people on social media that you could reach. And then I think another thing besides just in person when it's safe to be in person is what we're doing right now as well, which is doing the virtual but recording it so that you have an opportunity to see a whole presentation about whatever it is that you're trying to be engaging on. And again, that presentation, once it's recorded and posted, is available 24 seven. And to be sure that we, whenever we can, I wanna say whenever we can, like to plan, know what your demographic is, et cetera, so that you have a mail in, mail out option for people. So if they can't go online, there's a way for them to get a hard copy and comment and still um, be informed and share their feedback once they've been informed and engage with you. That's what I would say prior to Michael, or excuse me, prior to George Floyd's murder. That seems to change everything. I'm a Marvel person, Marvel like comic books. And in Marvel, there's the Avengers storyline. In the Avengers, there is like a main character. And one of the things that he does is he snaps his fingers. If you take a moment to snap your fingers, there's a small number of people that are gonna hear that. But when this person snaps their fingers, the impact touches one out of two people in the space that he's in, in the country, in the world, in the universe, et cetera. And it feels to me like when George Floyd was killed, everybody felt that. But he's not the first person. But for some reason, that's the straw that kind of broke the camel's back in terms of 
whether people were going to take action against that. When I said he's not the first person, um, there have been other black men and women, there have been Latino men and women, other people of color that have been killed. And there wasn't an outrage that lasted for weeks behind that. And to give you some background in case anyone is wondering, is this just this one person or is this just about Black Lives Matter? Um, is it just police uh, uh, brutality? There is a whole entire system that informs an African-American person's life. And that's based in racism. It's based, it starts in slavery, et cetera. And so what I'm showing for, to you right now is a screenshot of a slide that Dr. Marcus Hendricks shared during the National Planning Conference 20, uh, which was in May of this year. He's talking about um, demanding equity and thinking about disaster recovery. One of the things that I, the thing that I like about this graphic is it shows the effort and the labor and the stress and the tension that it, an African-American person is going through in this country just to live. It illustrates the framework of things that we experience and police brutality is just one of these things. This affects whether or not we're gonna have good quality of life or not. And it's designed in a way that's a lot more convoluted and crazy than the straight easy path that white Americans get to enjoy. But the thing about it is we had colonialism in our world and so this sort of feeling affects not only this experience not only affects african-american people in this country but things like it and related to it affect others the way that people of color are perceived affects people excuse me they are perceived negatively in other countries as well and a lot of that i would argue has to do with colonialism so what do you get we get a resurgence i think a strong strong resurgence for black lives matter in this country but not just here it's around the world and other um, cultures are united with African-Americans. And so now we see a lot of the, the term BIPOC a lot. That's black indigenous and people of color. We see Black Lives Matter and then we see the stronger together and there's other hashtags that we see. And that is from even though we know that there's all this stress and all these systems that inform how we feel, there's a basis in that, which is that indigenous people we're here before anyone else. And through land and all those things, their land was stolen from them. And Africans were brought over here through kidnapping and slavery, et cetera, and now here we are. But the system that we live in is very, 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 very stressful and has been going on for hundreds of years. So people are protesting. This is a map of the protests in the United States. As of last night, there were 3,960. And they're not just in the United States, they're around the world. And people are doing it from the local person to the celebrity. Uh, they're doing it without full precautions. It's not like everybody is six feet apart trying to protest. It's so important people are risking their lives. And they're doing it in a way that I think provides an argument for what is it that we do for engagement, but what do we do in other aspects? We should question what our approaches are, what our motives are, how we do our engagement plans. And so in 2015, there was, a, she's a blogger, but she also did some training for the International um, Association of Public Participation. And she was doing some rethinking of what it would mean to change that participation spectrum that I had showed you before. And so she came up with this one. And this one, we're looking at changing where power lies so that it's more in the hands of the people than the government. And when I think about the protests that are going on, and I think about how some of the organizations um, are actively demanding what they want, I think about how long that's gone on. And again, how long something goes on is directly related to it becoming a habit and be it becoming a norm. I think it's going to change how people speak out. And I think people will feel more empowered to speak out. So as we do engagement, I would ask you all, what should our engagement approach be like today? If before it was meetings and surveys and maybe someone's gonna stop by, 
we have a new normal now that's not just healthcare, it's culture and age and people who hadn't maybe thought about the impact of our systems, racism, et cetera, on other people are now having to think about it. And for some of them, it's the first time they're thinking about that. And for others, they've been aware to some degree, some to a greater degree. But all of those people are out there. And when we do engagement from a private, excuse me, private sector perspective or a public sector perspective, those are the people that we're going to encounter, at least some of them. So I asked to the group and ask Liz again to post in the chat this question. How should we engage? And I see from Cedar, community-led communities to empower, social media to inform. Someone else. And while you're thinking, I'll give you something that I was thinking about. And that is that um, someone not too long ago wanted to talk to me about how to do engagement in a particular community. And the way that they started the conversation was, well, Travis, um, we shouldn't do these things. And they were just a series of tools. And I said, well, I hadn't even, that, I didn't even have any of that in my mind at all. What was in my mind is that we should go, and in this case, I know that there are neighborhood groups out there, so we should go and talk to the neighborhoods. And we should see, since they're established groups, what approach would they prefer? How and when do they want to meet? Are they meeting? Do they want virtual? Do they not? And then we will mold ourselves around what it is that they want to do. And then that puts the choice and the approach of how we do engagement, what that style is in the hands of the people that we want to engage. It's one way to do that. Okay, so I see some more um, comments. I see from Michael, we should look for ways to reach folks that don't rely exclusively on digital. Robin, we should agree, agrees with Michael. Someone says, how do we empower the community? Another one says, same and diverse options. I agree, assuming we know how to engage them, that we know best, let the community choose how to engage with them, what works best for their community. Travis, yes. it's, it's too much for me to type, but I think one of the biggest things is we make an assumption about what they wanna be engaged on. Mm -hmm. so I think it's really important um, and the work that we're doing with Center for Neighborhoods um, we've been checking in with our neighborhood uh, associations that have come through our cohort weekly. Um, this past Tuesday, we just asked the question, what do you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. What's going on? And so I think as we look at different ways to approach, um, we also need to be mindful that what we feel like they should be engaged in mm -hmm. may not be what's their priority right now. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good comment, LaMonica, because I think something that I noticed too, and this was before there was COVID-19 and protests and all of that, is that some of the things that we work on because that's our passion, like it could be transportation, I'm picking that because this is by Kwak KC, um, that's not the top list for the neighborhoods or the community members. I mean, I just went through a project, we finished it in the fall, and it was about pedestrian connectivity and safety and routes and things like that. And lots of people were interested in that. And then we get to um, like, a, it was a joint planning commission and city council workshop. And all they could talk about was that we have gravel roads. Our roads are not in good repair. People are, we have basic service needs. It would be so great to have a sidewalk down Main Street. But these other streets aren't even paved. And we don't even know how we're gonna pay for that. So their conversations for that com particular community probably would have been better served to talk about how do they do their day to day and provide the services that they know residents have said that they want. Because sometimes some of the things we're talking about are kind of like, they're like amenities sometimes. Sarah said, um, those of us in the public sector have to start by building trust with the community. What do you want to talk about is a brilliant start. Caitlin said, build relationships that outlast specific projects. 
integrate those relationships into our structures and procedures. Cedar is saying use, use serving the community as a way to also build trust and relationships like the Panthers. So, Travis, if I could jump in, uh -huh. um, you know, something that I hear a lot about, but I don't see in practice a lot, are doing things like actually hiring people in the community to help with the engagement and the outreach, you know, mm -hmm. bringing the, the neighborhood association and the nonprofits in the community on to the consultant team and pay them mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. be involved. And I, I rarely see any cases where that happens. Do, do you, have you seen any cases where that type of a strategy has been used effectively to include the community from the very beginning? Well, I met a colleague who's based in Seattle, Washington, and they do that. That's a common thing to just pay people to give their feedback. I know I have written approaches where we are going to hire community members. Sometimes we've hired students to go and help us do work in a community. Um, when I was talking earlier about people's time, it's so, um, it's so valuable. And we also have to think about implementation and championship. And so if you can make your process through payment kind of someone's job, it begins to build some of that. But also a lot of planning seems like it's sort of for free. You have to spend your free time to do everything and everyone doesn't have that and implementation fails when you don't have staff so that gets back to having a budget but yeah there are communities that pay people regularly one of the um, things i think that sometimes people do if you are depending on what culture you're engaging sometimes that works better like if you have like gifts and things like that to offer like gift cards and things and you can get them to come to your stakeholder meetings for example Matt Kleiman is saying shared governance models where the most marginalized members of the community have decision-making power. I just lost something there. Requires um, sharing power from those already in leadership often starts with the building of a shared agenda and going to the existing community efforts to build models of community wealth like grocery stores etc for those engaging in research lean towards community-based participatory action research the power in the hands of those uh, proximate to the problems and issues and i ask you all a question why is it do you think that um, organizations and governments etc seem wary to give people power in their project. I think I'll add to that um, coming from, I'm with Center for Neighborhoods now, but I work for Unified Government in KCK mm -hmm. for 14 years. Um, and so being a part of it <laughs> is really interesting. I, I don't think people really realize what it takes to, to um, build relationships. If you really want true engagement, you have to build relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually was on the phone with uh, Andrea General, who's the director of Livable Neighborhoods before right. I jumped on this call. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we did a session at a workshop a couple of years ago called CPR and the difference between collaboration, partnership, and relationship. And you can have a great collaboration, you can have a great partnership, but without relationship, it stops right there. Mm -hmm. And so I think what happens is, is that uh, organizations, municipalities, they don't necessarily take the time to build the relationship so that it's a joint effort. I feel like sometimes the municipality feels like if we give the people the power, then we won't have a job. No, your job is to do what the people want. Mm -hmm. So if you let them tell you what they want, then that makes your job easier. Now you have to, um, you know, you, you flesh that out with the policies and the ordinances that are put in place. You flesh that out with the funding um, requirements. So when you're dealing with federal dollars, you have all these requirements. Well, the average person 
doesn't care about your requirements <laughs> mm-hmm. and they really just want to be heard. Mm-hmm. And so if you build relationships, then they know that you're listening, mm-hmm. but to pay someone to build relationships mm-hmm. for a lot of entities, mm-hmm. it's like, what? We're going to pay somebody to sit and have coffee with Miss, with Miss Susie? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Because Miss Susie can give you the 411 of the last 30 years. Mm-hmm. And she's going to tell you what has worked, what hasn't worked, and why. And so I think it's, it's a time commitment that is required. Mm-hmm. And I just don't feel like enough organizations, municipalities included, um, now working in a university setting as well, I just don't feel like they really take the time. Um, it's like it's taking, if you give somebody else power, then you're giving up your own power. Mm-hmm. And so I don't, I don't know. I feel like it's just a collective push against relinquishing power. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you all another question too, because um, some of the responses in here in the chat box say things like, um, because we like owning that power, we think we can do it best. We have a savior complex and that that's ingrained in the white community. So I wanted to ask you all another question and it's related to that, which is what do you think, oops, what do you think your role is in engagement? So if I went with what I just saw in the chat box that I've moved up to the top left of the screen, that you're a leader, you're running the, you're running the things. What do you think your role should be in this, in your approach to engagement as it is right now and how it's probably gonna go in the future? I see bridge building. So that means you would, you would be a bridge builder. Um, making sure that the um, door is, is open for um, the additional stakeholders in the community that need to um, uh, be in the conversation and need to be empowered. Mm-hmm. Vanessa, would you mind elaborating on your post? Do you have audio capability? I do. Yeah. Hi, I'm Vanessa Mikale, mm-hmm. um, and I work with the Portland Bureau of Transportation. Hi. Um, And I wanted to share that my colleague Irene Marion, who leads our equity program at the Bureau of Transportation, um, has been working really hard to try and push out some RFP opportunities. So we finally started sharing that widely with community and um, offering some information sessions about the various opportunities in those three areas that I put in the chat. So it is Um, challenging um, to get through some of the bureaucracy and contracting and and all of that Um, but we're hoping to build capacity and new partnerships and also put the money in community right now so Mm -hmm. that's an exciting and new um, RFP opportunity that's out. Mm -hmm. It does take a lot of time it takes a lot of time to do something like that certain amount of investment that has to go in. Cedar saying, pass the, mic- pass the microphone. And if there's a lot of turnover in your organization, that makes it hard. And Matt saying, spatial agency coordination with and lifting up existing community leaders to support their desired programs and policies. So in that role, How do you all identify stakeholders when you're doing a project? Like, how do you go about doing that to build those connections? Especially if there's turnover, there's a lot of effort, takes a lot of time. How do you do something like that? I think something to consider are those organizations Mm -hmm. who already um, are working with, so for us, we work with neighborhood groups. 
And so oftentimes we're um, people, other organizations ask us. So we've built the relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and I think utilizing organizations that have built those relationships. Um, I'm very um, passionate about making sure that there's transparency. So the reality of it is, is that you have to tell people exactly what it is you're wanting. And so I think if you're honest with that up front, then, and you build relationships with people who have relationships, I'm thinking specifically about um, organizations that come in, they've been contracted to come in and do a particular project. Um, I, I think one thing that's very um, heartbreaking is, uh, especially in my work in KCK, it's that you have people on the ground doing the work. We have local, at least regional organizations that do the work and then they hire from some, from some state, uh, some other state to come in and do the work. And so I think it's about being transparent about what you want. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to make sure that um, residents in particular understand what it is you're asking them for and that you have a clear understanding of what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes we go in and just say, well, this is what we need because we're checking boxes. So mm -hmm. that's what I would say to that. I'm going to go back a second to what's your role because I missed Karen's um, response. But she was thinking staying connected with those communities from time to time, excuse me, from the time they're initially engaged to when possible when the project begins. One of the bits of pushback we hear constantly is that no one told me this was happening because the community engagement sometimes happens years before any ground is broken. That does make, that kind of gets to one of the things that um, we talk about in almost every project, which is the management of expectations of basically what it is that's supposed to be happening or not happening with the project, how long it's going to be, et cetera. If you've lost connections, how do you rebuild those connections? And then what happens if you started something five years ago and now it's starting to become real? There's a big gap there. So if the role that you might be playing now or that you might have played before COVID-19 changes to what it should be today, which might be more related to collaboration, might be more relationship building, um, making a closer connection to the people on the ground in the communities that you serve, maybe letting go of some of that power. What's the first step that you think you can take in your new role? And it could be something small or it could be something really huge, but what's the first thing that you think you can do? And I'll tell you that when I think about this question, I think about the things that I do for work and I think about the clients that we serve, I think it is learning how to listen and how to ask questions. Because I think that, um, I think, I'm in the architecture and engineering field. And so part of that is, I think because of the training and some other things, we could be interviewing for a project. So we haven't won anything, but all types of designing is happening. Nobody's, I mean, we, you just look at all the data and like start trying to figure things out because you need to demonstrate to the client that you've thought of all possibilities. And I think that that can in some ways cripple what the potential could be in the project because you haven't talked to the community that the project is going to affect. And so if you could, if we could get to the point where we don't do that as much, I mean, you still need to be informed about the area that you're in, you need to look at data, but you also need to talk to people and do it in a way that is more inquisitive and curious about them than authoritative and this is what we're going to do and to the earlier comment, I'm going to check a box because I've done this now. And so again, listening and maybe stepping back and learning to ask questions, I think is good. Michael has said in response to that question about a first step, reaching out, asking for a meeting to start building that relationship. Carrie said reaching out directly personally tends to work best. 
What are some other first steps? Vanessa said, constantly remember and remind that our agency urgency is not often the community's urgency or priority. Make space for that in the organization, but not use that as an excuse to not put deep effort to meet the community where they are at and how they would like to. Matt said, be present as a first step. Really care about people. Invite others to the table. Follow through. Stick around for the long term. I think there's a, there's a lot to that, um, to that really caring about people and being curious about them because it's really clear by how our communities are designed, what we're taught in school, that people of color, African-American people, indigenous people have been left out of the shaping of what it means to be in a city and be in a place because that connection hasn't been made. I think a lot of times, probably most times, it feels like these projects are wanting something from people and they're not really making it clear what they're giving to people. And so I think especially for those that are in the nonprofit sectors and advocacy and community-based organizations that you know, if, if we want a community to care about, say, a transportation project, we also need to show we care about the other things that are on there. Mm -hmm. priority list and probably higher on their list mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't always feel like it's a one way that you know I might be asking you about transportation today but tomorrow I'm going to show up to help support affordable housing or you know whatever it is that you um, care about I think that's another way you get to that partnership mm -hmm. and that dialogue and also demonstrates an investment um, Carrie mentioned or she says get to know who's get to know the community and as you said, be curious, pick their brain. Robin said, make connections with other organizations as the norm, not just when you need them for something. She got a second from Carrie on that. Are there any other steps you think should be taken or that could be taken to follow up with what we've talked about so far? I think something that could potentially be helpful is you have to take individual inventory. Mm -hmm. So you need to know what your actual intention is mm -hmm. for the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I think if we take individual inventory and if we can in some way have those conversations with our teams that we're working with, then at least it's a united, when we go, we're going together. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to do more and people see our genuine concern. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you're put into a situation in a community where you don't know that community. Well, you might have to let someone on your team who doesn't normally take the lead, take the lead because mm -hmm. they do know the community. Mm -hmm. So I think part of that first step is taking a personal inventory of what your mm -hmm. intentions are. Mm -hmm. I think that's really good. It also speaks to just letting go of some of the control, especially if someone else may be better qualified or have a better connection with that community. Thomas has said, I'm interested in what constructive community education and information looks like in the context of quote, community empowerment framework. Because it seems like being community driven is not on its own enough to ensure good outcomes. We don't want to empower community outcomes that are driven by hate or ignorance. I think that's a big thing because um, there's a lot of fear. I think right now that things are going to change and um, I think that's causing some outliers in the conversation. And sometimes that drowns out some of the positive things that can happen with community empowerment. 
it also seems like a clear intention of what community what the outcomes of community empowerment are supposed to be and what how much power you actually have what does someone else think about that the idea of community empowerment and what that looks like i think that um community empowerment um it, it really it really is as as much as anything else it's an opportunity for for others to learn because i think it kind of goes back to this idea of kind of listening and asking the right questions um like yes i i think that if it's if it's left kind of just throw open the gates and just sort of thrust the entirety of do all of this onto a community then yes it is possible for it to um produce a result that that might um be that that could be a cause for concern for some of the stakeholders that you're actually trying to serve and so i think it, it really reinforces the need to kind of ask the questions not because you're trying to sort of limit that power but because you really do want to try to fully understand what it is that that a community wants because in in that respect even if even if a community doesn't know part of our job is to be able to say if this is what you want then these are the options that can help us to get to that point mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense mm -hmm. When you, I hear you say that, it makes me think about um, community planners, designers, engineers, et cetera, advocates as resources of information um, that can, that means that we can be leveraged by community members to achieve the goals that they have. At the same time, I can also see things where communities are empowered and that means that you're going to start having, excuse me, exclusivity issues and things of that sort. Gary has said, Thomas, I think when we stay close to the community and work to truly capital letters, know the individuals, the hate and the ignorance of the community, most likely. And she asks, is that naive? And I would answer that to saying staying close and actually knowing people is not naive and probably in it's not probably. I think it is where we need to be as a body of people. Because we have issues because we left people out intentionally didn't include them, thought that they were not contributors. And I will say specifically, white people over time, these hundreds of years, have left people of color, pushed them out, disregarded their thoughts as we develop our communities, et cetera. And now we are having an uprising about that whole entire thing and its impact. And if you take the time to get to know someone that's different than you, and it could be, it could be your culture, your race, it could just be, you know, your um, perspective. I think you have a better opportunity to connect with them and to know them, at least have an, under, an understanding to empathize with them. But if you don't do that, that's never going to happen. So I don't think you can go wrong in that way. But it doesn't mean that every experience is going to be benevolent and amazing. You might have some really trying conversations. But that's part of growth, I would argue. And with that, this has been a great conversation. It's 1259, you guys. My contact information is on screen. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to me to chat, I'm happy to do that. Um, I thank you so much for giving me some of your time and your lunch hour. I know that there's just more conversation and typing and, not, and probably less chewing and drinking coffee during a lunch and learn, but I really appreciate your time. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and give this back to Liz and Eric. All right. Thank you so much, Travis. This, um, I know that for me, this has been an informative and, uh, and, a real learning experience and I'm sure it has been for everyone else. Thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here with us. Um, I want to thank, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. 
I want to go ahead and thank our uh, I want to thank our sponsors and our funders for their support. Um, for this program that we're able to offer uh, while we're all uh, physically distant, as we were talking about earlier. Um, I want to thank the Health Forward Foundation, the Hall Foundation, Enterprise Bank, my sidewalk, our members and sponsors um, as a as a member supported organization, and also the uh, the Shun Family Family Foundation. Um, each person and each funder is very important to us, and this is how we do the work that we do. Uh, if you would like to see some of our previous uh, conversations that we've had, you can see those at bikewalkkc.org forward slash talk. Um, we'll have this recording up later on, as well as recordings that we've had for uh, previous conversations. And we've had some really good ones, so I hope that you're able to view those. Um, I would also like to say that uh, with our um, continued conversations and our continued advocacy efforts, if you would like to be a part of that, um, you are welcome to text Bike Walk KC to 52886 and join our advocacy email list. Um, you can also support our, our organization through that. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll be sending out an email um, tomorrow with uh, links and information um, to this, uh, links and information from this program. And uh, we look forward to continuing the relationship with each of you and please stay in touch. Thank you so much for joining us today.